Hey everybody, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm Paul Bissix. I'm a software engineer focusing mostly on Python, JavaScript, big web apps. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, security and mischief and hijinks that I experience on a Pastebin site that I've uh, been running for 18 years now, believe it or not. Um, just a quick sort of recap of how I got here in terms of that helps inform some of the th things I, I apply to what I'm doing. Um, my work, uh, I was a freelancer long ago, which is awesome lifestyle, and I was terrible at the business part, so I decided to get a real job uh, instead. Uh, and I worked then for the next five years in education at a uh, photography school. It used to be up in Turner's Falls, Hallmark Institute of Photography. Anybody remember it? Hallmark. Yeah. The, the previous slide, the National Leaders Book Center, that's local, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. These, these were my freelance clients. So, yeah, I, I did the first Emily Dickinson Museum website, and the Book Center was a client of mine for a long time. They're great. Or um, they just grew up enough. They got they did a twenty five million dollar fundraise for their twenty fifth anniversary, and they graduated to not just having one web person anymore. Um, worked at Hallmark, taught web design, and built lots of web apps for them. Um, and in that time frame, I created the little first version of Dpaste, um, which I'll circle back to sort of what's what it's like now. Um, and also in that time, I co-wrote a book, uh, one of the first books on Django, and that's sort of been my my uh, thread professionally for most of my jobs, is playing off that. Um, and if you want weird covers, I recommend the um, the Russian one because it's rustling a snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that's my favorite of the three translations. Um, I went full time remote work in 2011. Um, I left the photography school and the jobs I found tended to be elsewhere. So that is my map of everywhere I've had coworkers, um, which is kind of fun. Nice. And uh, yeah, South America's on the rise, by the way. I've had the last few jobs, I've had more and more South American coworkers. That's uh, in in Brazil. He's, he's a big Python rock star down there. Um, so then after that, I worked for a company in Atlanta for several years on a giant media publishing system of theirs. Oh. Um, and they, they don't have much of a footprint around here, but they're, they have a lot of national brands. Um, the downside of working for them is Cox Media Group. People think you work for Cox Cable, and they have Cox Cable, and everyone hates their ISP, so they want to come to you with their complaints about their <laughs> service. But luckily, that wasn't too much of an issue around here. Um, from there, I went to work mostly remotely for Mass Challenge, which is a startup accelerator based in Boston. So I go in every couple weeks. Um, when I got that job, we were it was looking great, and I had met the whole team and met the head of engineering, and the CEO, and everything. And they offered me the job, and I said, "Oh wait, did I mention I'm not going to move to Boston?" And they're like, "Hmm." <laughs> I forgot every other job I'd looked been looking at had been remote, and so I'd somehow forgotten to raise that question with them. Luckily, they said, "Well, let's give it a try. We're going that way anyway. Why don't you come in every two weeks for sprint review?" And so I did it, and it was fantastic. A um, few other smaller jobs since then, so I'll skip over. But now I work for uh, this great company that you've never heard of called LC Vista. They do learning and compliance um, uh, for accounting firms, which apparently, and if you're an accountant, you have to do a lot of professional training. Continuing, continuing professional education is massive there, and 80% of the accountants at the top 200 firms use our platform to manage all their learning stuff. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a neat thing. It's a, it's a great niche and a uh, good team and tech that I am well versed in. So that's my sort of resume in brief. But what I wanted to uh, talk about today was this paste bin site I made way back in 2006 called dpaste. Um, and just so sorry to preview the um, timeline, I want to allow plenty of time for questions. I think the um, nominal end of our slot is, is 11.15, but I'm going to aim to stop by 11 to, because the discussions and questions are almost always very worthwhile here. So, um, so I showed you the 1.0 uh, screenshot of DPACE. This is more or less the uh, current version. Um, I created it back in the ancient times because I was very active in the Django community then, and Pasteman.com was still pretty new and was having some stability problems. And so we would be trying to be share code and they they'd be throwing 500s or having other issues. And so I was like, how hard could it be to make a paste bin? And um, so I did it, and it was not hard at all. Um, and people started using it. And the next thing I knew, it showed up in the 
the topic line of the IRC channel for Django. And so it sort of became this de facto community thing um, that I had to sort of whip together as a replacement for the broken uh, pasteman.com. But it's been really fun over the years to keep it going and, and expand it and have it as sort of a fun side project and also as a proving ground for things that I want to be able to learn and use in my day job, but not ready. So it's the first time I used Python 3 was I just converted this whole thing over and see which unit test blew up. Um, or first time I upgraded to the latest version of Django, I'll do it here, see what's up, and then be able to be less uh, less surprised when I, when I do it at work. Um, so the sort of some color about the site, um, the, the Django connection is here. This is a Django error page. And if you get a, if you're in debug mode and running a Django site in development and you get an error page, there's this button that says share this trace back on the public website. That's my site. So that points to, that shares the verbose trace back to my site. Um, that integration is still there. I, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's flattering, but it's a little weird that this dominant web framework just has, uses one guy's face bin for the stuff. Like, it's weird that nobody has submitted a PR to make that configurable and send it to, you know, pasteman.com or just or whatever. But someday I'll right. write that PR. <laughs> no pressure on you. <laughs> what happens if you get hit by a bus? Um, then somebody will submit that patch just <laughs> these things and other things. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, this is for developers in debug mode. So it, it isn't, it's a great question because if this was somehow part of the sort of production mode of the site, that would be dicey. Um, but instead it's just sort of developer convenience that, that some people happen to still use. Um, the other bits on here, I made a CLI for it as an excuse to learn Go and I, I made a little, uh, project so you can pipe stuff into the CLI and have it show up in your account. It knows about your authentication and whatnot. Got a Mastodon account for status. So when the when the server goes down, I have some way to tell people <laughs> what's up about it. Um, and then those are some stats. I don't actually publish these stats anymore, but I used to have these on the about page, which was, I realized it was kind of fun for me. I don't know if anybody else cares. So what's the distribution of users across the globe who use this thing? Um, and it, that sort of ebbs and flows, uh, but the top top half dozen are pretty consistent. Uh, and then sort of what people are using it for. Most people, plain text, just because they can't be bothered to set the little menu that says, oh, this is actually Rust or whatever. Um, but it gives you some idea of sort of what where the communities are that, uh, that use it. So to get into the badness, um, I'm just going to run through, I've got about half a dozen different ways that people <coughs> abuse the, the site, whether it's uh, something that's an immediate problem for me or whether I want to stop it because I know it could lead to other problems. So uh, <clears throat> I have a rate limit on the site. I didn't do this initially because it wasn't it wasn't really an issue, but um, the rate limit is one request per second, um, which is, you know, not going to get in anybody's way if they're a human being, but it um, is a stop for anybody who decides to write a script and see how many, how many items could I produce in one minute. Um, <laughs> And I have automated uh, blocking, and I'll show you some of that because I said I would also talk about the actual implementations. But um, this has been my policy now for several years, um, and it's working fine. And I haven't had anybody who uh, told me that it was an obstruction to their their work. Um, and in fact, I had one nice library author who wrote a TypeScript library that that talks to my API, put in their documentation a note about the rate limit and put into their code uh, a one second pause so that it's not easy to abuse the library, um, to, to use the library to um, exceed the rate limit. Like I said, I automatically kick people a 429, which is rate limit exceeded, if they exceed it. So they are not, regardless of what they're doing on their end, I'm not suffering a, a sudden flood of, of new items, for example. Um, but um, it's still nice to not have to have the server doing too much of that. Um, so implementation wise, just want to show my little, this is more or less the, the heart of the rate limiting. I just want to show it off because I felt very clever when I used the cache for the expiry of rate limit items. I just, if somebody hits the site once, I put an entry in the cache that says 
this IP, hit the site, and give it a one second expiry. If they come back before one second, I check and there's still a thing there, and I know, and I can increment the count, say, oh, you've, you've hit me again. If they wait two seconds, that magically expires from the cache, and they're clear to go. So that's all I have to do. There's no cleanup jobs or anything. It's just cache uh, entries and cache expiry. That's and nice. Yeah, I was, I was really satisfied when I did it because I was like, that's really all I need. Um, and then if they exceed the threshold that I set, I will add them to my block list as well. So initially, they just they just sort of get kicked. So you exceeded the rate limit, but if they do it too many times, they get blocked. Um, and by default, that's that lasts, I think, seven days. I'll talk more about the block list piece because that's, that's a component that I, I added in. Nice. Um, but that's, so, so that, that takes care of a lot of the um, sort of busy work that I would otherwise have to do, keeping track of things I used to scrape my logs and count IPs and just all this stuff, trying to find sort of the worst uh, offenders. But this automation freed me from all that and, and solves the problem even better, really. Uh, so that's that's how I deal with the rate limiting. I will note, this is on the application level. So if you're having a really busy site that had some real need to throttle traffic, you don't do it at the application level. That's, that's a pretty expensive place to do it. I do it because my traffic isn't such that, you know, if I get a million requests in a day, that's a lot for me. Um, and so it's not, uh, this is this is a good, for when you're running something on a platform as a service and you don't have access to Nginx or Apache or whatever the actual server is, or IP tables, you can do this if you're not running, you know, Facebook. Um, so that's my rate limit bit. And this, this was just a capture of a little exchange. Um, that nice TypeScript library author <coughs> had a uh, <coughs> naughty customer who used their library and has made, well, by first report, <laughs> they'd, they'd done over 500,000. Um, they got up to a couple million uh, from the single IP. And I was just sending nag messages to the, the owner of that net block. And uh, finally, they, they submitted when I mentioned that I was going to ask my hosting provider to block their entire IP range. Um, and I sent them 100 megabytes of logs just of the requests from this one IP of theirs. Uh, they could, when they asked for logs, I'm like, you asked for logs, OK? Yeah. There you go. So um, it's always nice to see responsive <laughs> admins. Um, and oh, this is the this is the library. So uh, I, I sent the person a note saying, "Hey, by the way, I don't blame you, but uh, <laughs> somebody just used your library. You made three million requests to my site." Um, okay, spam is another thing. There's here's a weird one. Um, I still don't know where this comes from. I think it's a sort of just SEO business thing. I get tons, hundreds of these business listing things. They are not from the people who whose businesses are represented, typically. If I look at the, the where the IPs are, they're all, all over the place, and there'll be like a you know, Florida swamp tour business, and there's some IP in Pakistan has posted the listing for it. So I think they're probably SEO service that will get your business on all the directories and whatever, and they just, I'm in one of 100 sites they just push the button to spam out to. I block it because I don't need this stuff in my database, and uh, it's not. It's explicitly not what the what the site is for advertising. Have you recognized it? Um, <clears throat> I, I have a heuristic rule that looks for a certain keywords, and there's certain telltales like there's no there's no title. They don't set a programming syntax. It's not code. It doesn't match any of my heuristics for what code looks like. Um, and I sort of filter that way, and then I do a manual inspection. So I I do periodic inspections of things that have tripped the the rough flags. So I don't want false positives. I don't want to like delete something um, automatically that t turns out to be valid. Um, but I have rules that automatically flag certain things, and then I can do the final call and say, uh, "Is this is this actually violating the terms of service?" Which it is. Um, and then another badness: uh, vulnerability probes. <clears throat> if you've run a server and looked at your logs regardless of what your tech is. I mean, this is a Django and Python site. There's no PHP or WordPress within 100 miles of this, but <clears throat> I regularly get these probes that are looking for, um, you know, whatever. There's some exploit that you can do with some bad uh, WordPress extension, and they're going to they're gonna scrape 
the paths where it might be, and if they find it, then they'll do their exploit. I just, I just say no, and I use the universal uh, HTTP response code for I'm a teapot, which is sort of the, my way of giving them the finger. <laughs> um, because that just <laughs> keeps happening. And I, nothing good is going to come from these IPs. And these blocks are not forever. They're a week or two. Um, so if it's a dynamic IP and the you know, amateur cyber criminal moves on and the IP gets recycled by somebody else from that ISP, they'll be able to use it later on. It's not, it's not a forever ban. That's just a little one that annoys me. Um, this is a funny one. The enumeration attacks. That's when, let's say you have a nine digit base 32 ID, somebody might decide they're going to try every single one. This would, I, I did the math, I forget, but um, <clears throat> at one per second, which is the maximum they can actually get responses for on the order of 100 years, I forget. Um, <laughs> um, but that's per IP, right? Yeah. So look. Lots of different IPs. Distributed. Um, anybody recognize those IPs? Fifty-four dot eighty dot. No, no, no. Oh, I've seen it. Almost all in Virginia, coincidentally. <laughs> um, so this is just I did a, a map with the IP geo service. Um, yeah, the vast majority are are. Uh, so somebody's got a little AWS job that's just running. It's been running for months. Um, attempting to scrape the entire key space. I don't know whether there's one thing that they know is there they're looking for. Mm. They're spies. I have suspicions. What do you think, Michael? Um, I think that, so, uh, people might share code. I'm, I'm assuming on, on Pastebin there's a way to do private ones so that only if you have the link to it you can that, get it. All of mine are like that. There's yeah. Nothing. Unless you explicitly so, publish it, it's not So people public. will use this internally even in private organization with proprietary data yeah. and they'll put shit there that they're not supposed to. Yeah. Please. And yeah. I bet you anything, they're, it's just, this is like mining for crypto. Mining, key. that's great. Yeah, I think that's the most likely explanation. That yeah. But they might find something Yeah, they might valuable. find something real good in there. Yeah, so we'll we'll see. I, once like a while, my I, curl that has the company password is a quirky. Right. <laughs> well, they both yeah. got access to this asset by doing the same thing, is they were searching GitHub or something, found an API key. They got them into these AWS instances and just have a little job running yeah. in the background. Yeah. Right, stop with their instances. Not that I would do that. That's <laughs> diabolical. Yeah, no, that's, I thought, I like that very well. And they don't even have to cover the entire space. They can just do a sampling. Maybe they might, it's a fishing right. expedition. Right, they do, they, they have increased their chance of uh, finding some gold. Um, and then here's a, here's a newer one, which I call sign up hijinks. Um, this is a snap from my user admin interface and uh, somebody <coughs> got into cre automated creation oh, yeah. of accounts. So every single one has a username that's 10 to 12 characters and en ends in a capital letter, is all under lowercase. And they're all Gmail addresses with plus addressing with a five character string at the end. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of a few patterns that they use. Thankfully, whoever is doing this only has two or three sort of signatures for their work. So I have automation that flags, that dis disables the accounts temporarily. Then I check, and then I, uh, then I get rid of them um, for good. Um, I care about this because one, if they're setting up accounts, uh, bogus accounts, they may be doing that so they can do some of the spamming that I referenced in the previous. Uh, rate limiting messages. on that. Uh, yeah, rate limiting across the site. So okay. they're yeah they're um, they have a lot of IPs too, um, and when I typically if I if I were to delete these, I record the sign up IPs. For a dozen new accounts, it's a dozen different IPs. Um, it's rare to see. As I've blocked more and more of their IPs, I've seen more reuse of IPs, but they, they have a very large pool. I have numbers somewhere in a, in a subsequent slide. The other reason I block, I, I want to stop this, is this could very easily be mailbox bombing for Douglas Gordon 0580, which may be a legit unrelated Gmail user. So. For whatever reason, they might be creating 100 accounts with plus addresses on his account to fill his inbox with junk. Wow. Um, yeah. Have you thought about checking the IPs you're getting attacks from against block lists? I have. I basically have the best block list now. Okay. I, I, I get better. I, I can, because I don't have to, um, I have heuristics for all these things. Mm -hmm. I can 
detect immediately whether they're, they're doing bad stuff or not. It's a good, good suggestion. I've done it in the past. After I added the automation, I found it wasn't, it didn't help oh, okay. anymore. Um, but these, these are... What's it's interesting know? that they would get you to bomb the inbox because of what they're doing. Yeah. It's interesting. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's odd. That's just a theory. You know, I don't know if there's some other thing. Because um, you don't want them to get explain the, it. You don't want them to identify the real email thing that's scary. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I don't want my, I don't want to be blocked by anybody for sending spam when they, they send a thousand, uh, you know, mailbox <laughs> inbox to some poor victim. Um, the, I looked at the IPs. Um, there's about 1,200 different IPs in my list right now for this. That's down from about a peak of maybe 2,500 or so. So they've got a big pool of IPs, mostly apparently U.S. and, and Europe. Um, but that's a lot of, you know, they've got just that resource. They're probably using it for many other things as well, but that's, uh, that's part of their thing. And then spam. <clears throat> um, I hate spam and I have some spam detection. This is just a sample of, uh, my, <laughs> did a quick search. I have a, an internal tool I use, uh, called the expunge tool, which lets me do arbitrary searches against different attributes of items and, um, this is just a, a quick one. For some reason, reason their name is always Eric. Um, and so these are uh, just spam that's taken up DB space. And um, off also, one of the things that comes with spam, not this particular message, is they're basically using your site for free hosting of their commercial message. Um, and so if that, if and if they spam out that link, then you become a link in a, spam message that then is at risk of getting blocked. So um, I just mostly want to take down spam whenever I can. Um, one of the technical solutions I adopted to deal with all this is I had built, like my own homebrew rate limiter thing, I built a homebrew block list app and I decided to uh, carve it out into its own project. So this is there. Uh, I know it has users because I've received two and merged two pull requests for it. So it's, which is exciting with, you know, a rare open source project where you share something and, and discover someone actually used it. Um, so that was exciting. Um, but this is what I, what I use for the block listing. Um, and I, you saw earlier, there was a utility function that added the IPs to the block list when they exceeded the rate limit, uh, a certain number of times. Um, and this lets me do other stuff, uh, too. I have a, you know, admin interface so I can see sort of where they're at. Um, and every every IP has a has a reason attached to it, so I know if I'm interested in th this particular kind of uh, IJinx, I can see sort of where that's how I built those graphs of the different geographical spreads of the IPs is their their index by the different kinds of offenses. Um, and cooldown is the amount of time that it has to not connect to the site before it gets purged. So there's a there's an hourly cleaning job that runs, and if an IP in the list hasn't been seen in longer than the cooldown period, then it gets deleted. Um, and this is just convenience for me. And you'll see most of the tally is how many times I've seen it. So these are all repeat offenders. <laughs> That's not the rule. There's many in there. There's probably about 12,000 IPs in the, in the list. Um, many of them are only seen once, um, but some of them are seen 474,000 times. Let's see. Right, this is, a, this is one of the scrapers. Um, one of the most active uh, scrapers, this thing. That's my code for the people who are there fetching the text form of every uh, permutation of key. And then um, I have internal reporting. Whoop, hey, nope. Internal reporting for this too, um, so I can see again, sort of what are the what are the hot spots, and if there's a, a rise in any particular flavor. Um, so here's the, here's the, you can see sort of the, the counts of how many IPs and how many requests they've made per different uh, offense. Are you able to tell how many concurrent connections they, they've, they have for these attacks? Say more. Huh? What do you mean? Uh, so like, uh, are they, are you detecting like for any given time, there's like 60 things trying to within a second? Oh, or yeah. Or like a hundred or a thousand? It's a great question. I haven't. Um, it's, I think, mostly because I don't need to know that. Um, 
It's a good question. I'm just it, curious how many concurrent. Yeah. Right. Like if they sort of in their command like, and control, did they, fire they say up, you know a thousand machines and they're hitting. Yeah. Them? The the time windows are pretty narrow. Certainly within within a few minutes, I can see like the uh, bogus account creation. I'll I'll see a bunch of accounts made within a couple seconds from a dozen different IPs. So there's that there's that much concurrency anyway. It's a good question. I don't I don't uh, have something that puts out stats for it. Um, and yeah, there's a few other categories I didn't talk about in here like. Uh, financial crime. These are basically carters. They're like credit card dumps with pins. Send me a thousand dollars of Bitcoin, and I'll send you blah blah. And that's a that's a frequent uh, <laughs> frequent advertising message that people put out there. So I block them with attrition. Uh, and finally, just there's all those those bad actors out there. But what I really care about is people using the site for what it's intended for and having them be happy. And so I want to see that, you know, somebody from Wilmington posted something 11 seconds ago and people share these things and that's, that's what it's all about. So that's how I fight badness at DPaste. Any questions? I'd love to hear questions. Yeah. Uh, have you considered using AI or some other more sophisticated ML tools for like spam detection, et cetera? Great question. Yes. Um, it's on my list of things where I would learn something that I need to learn and could improve the results of my tooling. So yeah, that's like an ML system that it, I train on my significant corpus. I could start saving, you know, if I start saving tomorrow, I'd have a, a corpus of, of a thousand things in a week to train my model. So yeah, that's that's absolutely the way to go. What I, I don't want to do that as a sort of uh, cloud function, I think, where I'll just ship it to the body and get a Got it, yeah, or nay. So, yeah. Uh, so, this was awesome talk. It's rare I ever hear anything that covers this, and much less like this is, I can fit all this in my head. <laughs> yes. Like, usually when I hear about these things, like, yes, we have, you know, 17 data clusters and we have right. telemetry, and I'm like, I can understand <laughs> Lasers. it. Lasers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I loved, I loved your, um, I loved your trick for using the cache yeah. <laughs> and like detecting it as like, oh, it's a bad actor. Yeah. Um, or you're, you're violating that. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about like, uh, how do you track, like you say you give the 429 immediately. Yeah. How do you um, track like, ah, uh, you've done this so many times, I'm just gonna ban you. Um, the cache entry is an integer that goes up by one every oh. time they hit. Oh. So if they hit well, half a second later, their number is two. They had a half second after that. Because number is three. What's the threshold? Ten. Ten. Nice. All right. Yeah, this is cool. And do um, do it's been a while since I've used DPace. Um, does everything expire? Like you know, like the longest something can be kept at six week? Are the things that live, stay forever? No, the uh, three sixty five days is the longest. Okay, so things will fall out. So yeah, okay, cool. So that sort of caps the amount of you know database expense I can incur from people posting junk. Um, but yeah, the, the, everything eventually expires. Well, this is a very useful um, for me because I have, um, I'm trying to convince the, the clients that I'm working with to, to provide access to another system instead of us manually having to go to it. But one of the problems is uh, developers could accidentally hit it too frequently. So being able to rate limit it and make the gateway rate limited uh, is would be super useful. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to use that trick. Yeah, I, I would love it if that got some play because I, I was very chuffed with it. Anybody else? All right, for a bonus, I've got the complete source code for the 2006 version of DPaste. Nice. <laughs> take, will, take a screenshot, take a picture with your phone, and uh, run with it. So that's I, what I say when people ask I, for the I source. I just have one more other question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, before you put up the rate limiting slide, the, the first thing I thought of was, I'm like, how many people have tried to use DPaste as a database? And I'm like, it, I'm like, that's why you put the rate limit on it. <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, no, there's funny. I there's a whole sidebar of things that aren't don't violate my terms of service, but are curious and resource consuming. Um, and one is somebody's got a some kind of chat bot that logs every individual message from some forum to DPaste. So I've got this steady stream of messages coming in that just from some chat channel somewhere um, over and over again. Weird. So you know they're they're not violating my rate limits or any of my other terms. So that so I've seen that. And for the other like more prosaic database uses, I, somebody created a um, an activity tracker site 
you know, mapping and uh, running, biking, that kind of thing. And it can save, it's all a front end thing, but it can save your track data to DPACE. So it uses it as a storage. Interesting. Mechanism just because you want to do that. Yeah. Um, could you say a little more about the heuristics that you use for, for say, the text based ones? Like, do you, do you use regular expressions or do, do you just have little blocks of text that you look for? Or? Great question. Yeah, it's mostly regexes or, or inclusion of a particular string within the, within the text. And often there, there are uh, other factors like whether they set the optional fields like the expiry length or the syntax or the um, <clears throat> title, um, which are not required. And so if they're sort of automating it. Uh, to the hill, they may be skipping those. But yeah, it's it's looking for certain tokens that the signify and the absence of certain tokens that would automatically. For example, I didn't mention this this uh, funny little form of abuse. Um, I call it the debug form hijacking. Way back in the beginning, I showed there's a button that says share this traceback on a public website, um, and that copies the traceback content in a particular form, and boom, spam bots have found that form on people's Django sites that are running in debug mode but are publicly accessible, which used to be verboten, and now they're like, okay, whatever. But um, so if you're a spam bot and you found this and you found a web form that posts somewhere, you don't care. And so um, I get things that have the signature of that de-paste debug post, but the content is all wrong. And so I look, in those cases, I look and say, if it's, if the signature, I, the, the, there's a user agent, there's a couple things that sort of that form submits along with the content that should be there. And if they're there, but the content doesn't have any reference to the, the boilerplate that's always there for the traceback, I know it's a hijack and they get blocked. So, yeah, that's... And that's where the mining could go. It could find those, find the vulnerable websites and hit them. Right, right, because maybe they're, uh, they're in their local variable section of the, of yeah. the traceback. Yeah, like, oh, this is open to debug. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, I just have one. Uh, that might be a place where you can start using AI because if you're finding the the the, the text they put in that you know because you know that it's not the right text, you could save that text and then and then uh, add it to your list of things that that might be spam. Absolutely, yeah, that would be a good way to, to expand that corpus of known junk. Yeah. So you said that most of the text you get is plain text because people don't really uh, select the language, right? Yep. So could you use some heuristics to maybe detect the language they're uh, putting that paste in so that you have better data for that? Um, yeah, in fact, I do that. Um, it's a feature of the site um, that, and it's, it, I haven't built that ML model yet, so it, it's not very sophisticated, but if you put something into the content box and you wait three seconds, it behind the scenes, it posts it to a little endpoint I have that runs a set of rules on it and guesses whether it, it might be PHP or Python or so. so, so um, I do that to that extent, um, and I've, I've started, started, as the guessing gets better, I surface it more, so there's a way to override the existing syntax of an item, and I can suggest which syntax you might override it with based on that. So, yeah, I like your, your leading me down the, the path I want to go, which is... <laughs> do, you, do you check for near duplicates over and over? Because like a lot of the things like hi I'm Eric blah 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 <laughs> and like there's like one token that's different but then next five thousand is the same same way. Yeah, I don't. Um, for those, it's mostly the presence of specific text that catches yeah. them, and so it's the so the whole the variations in the whole don't matter that much. But yeah, that would be again I think. Uh, I would expect a nice wide variation. More yeah from yeah. real humans. Yeah 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 yes. Yeah, Interesting. That would definitely.